I'm in 2 Chronicles chapter 30, and I'm still looking at King Hezekiah. And we're still looking at how Hezekiah turns things around. And one of the ways he turns things around is he yields himself to God. And if you want to turn things around in your life, you need to yield yourself to God. So look at 2 Chronicles chapter 30, starting in verse 1. It says, And Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah and wrote letters. He wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel. So Hezekiah is turning back to God. Hezekiah is yielding himself to the Lord. And he's trying to turn someone else back to God. A good way to stay in good fellowship with God is once you get back in fellowship with God, work on getting other people in fellowship with God. And you can get so busy doing that that you yourself stays in fellowship with God just from doing that. And the first thing, but the first thing you need to do when it comes to yielding yourself is yield yourself to godly letters. Here you've got Hezekiah sending out godly letters to Israel and Judah. And what you have in the Bible is 66 love letters from God himself. And you need to yield yourself to those 66 letters from the Lord himself. You need to go to the Pauline epistles. Epistles are letters. Paul wrote you the Pauline epistles. He wrote you some letters to help you get your doctrine straight that you need to yield yourself to. You go to them things for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And if you're not in the Bible, you're not going to know how to yield yourself. How can you... Live a godly life when you don't even know how God wants you to live. So you need to go to these 66 letters. You need to get your main doctrine from the Pauline epistles. And every single book of the Bible has doctrine for you. Every single book of the Bible, every verse of the Bible has practical application for you. For you to know how to walk from day to day. And can tell you how to keep things turned around. So he wrote. Hezekiah wrote. Almost all the great Bible characters were writers. For example. Moses in Exodus 24 and verse 4. He was a writer. Acts 13.33 talks about David. David wrote. Daniel 7.1. Daniel was a writer. The father himself. God. Exodus 31, 18. He was a writer. The Ten Commandments were written with the finger of God. His hand came down and put the handwriting on the wall. You know, the great Bible characters were writers. Yield yourself to God. Write something down to pass to somebody else to turn them back to God. So Hezekiah, he was a writer. He wrote letters to Israel and Judah, trying to persuade them to come to the house of the Lord, trying to turn people back to God, to keep the Passover, get back to keeping the things of God. It says, For the king had taken counsel and his princes and all the congregation in Jerusalem to keep the Passover in the second month. So they had taken counsel. You know, a good way to stay in fellowship with God, stay on the right track with God, is wise counsels get you some wise counsels in proverbs chapter 1 and verse 5 it says a wise man will hear and will increase learning and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels attain unto wise counsels get around the right kind of people that's going to give you the right kind of counsel that's what hezekiah did and in turn he was given good counsel unlike contrast that with king rehoboam back way back there one of the first kings we talked about he took 
advice from the wrong counselors. And that's what started the whole mess with Israel and Judah to begin with. So it says in Second Chronicles 30, For the king had taken counsel and his princes and all the congregation in Jerusalem to keep the Passover in the second month. For they could not keep it at that time because the priests had not sanctified themselves sufficiently. Neither had the people gathered themselves together to Jerusalem. So at that time they couldn't keep it because of the priests. They hadn't sanctified themselves sufficiently. So sanctified, that means set apart. They hadn't been setting apart themselves sufficiently. But look what happens. And the thing pleased the king and all the congregation. So they established a decree to make a proclamation throughout all Israel from Beersheba even unto Dan that they should come to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel at Jerusalem. For they had not done it of a long time. Notice that phrase. For they had not done it of a long time in such sort as it was written. So it doesn't matter how long you've been away from God doesn't matter how long that you were slack in doing something. God just wants you to come back. It doesn't matter how long. In James 4, in verse 8, it says, Draw not to God, and he will draw not to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. So it says, Draw not to God, and he will draw not to you. It doesn't matter if you have been away of a long time. God just wants you to come back. And if you draw not a God, he's right there. He's going to draw not a you. He just wants you to yield yourself. Yield yourself to the godly letters. Yield yourself to godly counsel. The king had taken counsel. Yield yourself to godly separation. You see, the priests had not sanctified themselves sufficiently. This held them back some. Held them back quite a bit. You see, when you don't sanctify yourself, you don't set apart yourself from the world and stay in the things of God, it'll hold you back. So yield yourself to godly separation because it's long overdue. Uh, it's probably been a long time since you cared about the things of God, since you were in the Bible, since you went around other Christians and, and tried to do things for God. Just like them, it says, for they had not done it of a long time. But it doesn't matter how long you've been away, you can come back. It says in verse 6, so the posts, the posts, that's like postmen. The posts went with the letters from the king and the princes throughout all Israel and Judah. And according to the commandment of the king, saying, ye children of Israel... Turn again unto the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and he will return to the remnant of you that are escaped out of the hand of the kings of Assyria. So the posts, those are like postmen. See, back to that writing, the letters there. Write down some godly, biblical things and mail it to people. Anybody can do that. Write down something online, send it to people. That's something you can do. Write down godly letters. Yield yourself to the spreading of the word. Any way you can spread the word. It doesn't have to be that way. You can be any way. But you yield yourself to spreading the word. It's going to help you stay on the right track. It's going to help you turn things around. So it says, Ye children of Israel, turn again unto the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, in Israel. Israel is Jacob. God changed Jacob's name to Israel. And it says, and he will return to the remnant of you. See, the moment you turn to God, he turns to you. Draw not to God, he'll draw not to you. And it says in verse 7, and be not ye like your fathers. See, sometimes your fathers weren't a good influence. I'm, I bet I'm talking to a bunch of people right now who has a very bad influence from their father. Maybe he was a drunk. Maybe he wouldn't work. Maybe he didn't care about the things of God. 
And you shouldn't be like him if he was like that. You ever heard the saying, I'm becoming my father? If you had a bit of bad influence of a father, don't let that hold you back because you got a heavenly father who is a good influence. And another common phrase is, sons follow their daddies. Most times, the son will be just like his dad. A son will just act just like him and do the things that he did. So that should remind you, if you're a father, you need to keep yourself clean. You need to yield yourself to the godly letters. Yield yourself to godly counsel, to godly separation. It doesn't matter how long you've been away. You can come back. And the more you, if you come back and you stay in fellowship, you turn things around, your son sees it, and it's going to put him on the right track more, more times than not. So be ye not like your fathers. Ye, instead, yield yourself to the heavenly father. If you don't, you don't have a good father to look up to, yield yourself to the heavenly father. And be not like your fathers, and like your brethren, which trespass against the Lord God of their fathers, who therefore gave them up to desolation as ye see. You don't have good parents to look up to? No brethren around to look up to? Look up to the Father. Which you should be doing anyway. Even if you do got good parents. Your example is laid out in the scriptures. The Lord made himself an example for us. Paul, he made himself a pattern for us. He says in verse 8, Now be ye not stiff-necked, you know, like stubborn. In Proverbs 24, 1, it says, in Pro or Proverbs 29, 1, it says, He that being often reproved, hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. Don't be stiff-necked. Don't be stubborn. Don't be hardening your neck. Now be ye not stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves. You see? You need to yield yourself unto the Lord and enter into his sanctuary, which he has sanctified forever, and serve the Lord your God, that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. You see that they had the they would have the wrath of God on them if they didn't turn to the Lord. Look at some stuff about his wrath. Isaiah 13, 13. Isaiah 13, 13. It says, Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place, and the wrath of the Lord of hosts, and in the day of his fierce anger. There's coming a day at the second coming where the Lord is going to pour out his wrath on the inhabitants of this earth. And they're going to drink the cup of his wrath. And notice that's Isaiah 13, 13. Let's look at another one. Revelation 16, 19. It says, And the great city was divided into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. You see, mystery Babylon, one day she's going to drink the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. You see, the Lord has a cup. You have, there's a cup with your name on it, with your nation's name on it. And... Every time a person just stays in sin, just keeps sinning, the cup gets fuller and fuller of the wrath of God until one day he just pours it out on you. And he's, he's telling them here, serve the Lord your God that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. But see, today, if you're saved, we got something greater than any of these guys had in the Old Testament. It says he's delivered us from the wrath to come. Paul said, we're saved from wrath through him. 
We're not ever going to have to worry about ever experiencing any of the wrath of God. Now, our flesh, we can, we can, if we stay in sin and we don't yield ourselves to God, we can, we can be turned over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. If you live for the flesh, you'll die. You can lose your health. You can use your, lose your testimony. You can lose your assurance and your joy, but you can't lose your salvation. And the wrath of God is not abiding on you like it is a lost person. But you can, you can shave time off of your life. By not yielding yourself to God, by not turning to God. But back in Second Chronicles 30 and verse 9, it says, For if you turn again to the Lord, your brethren and your children shall find compassion before them that lead them captive, so that they shall come again into this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn away his face from you if you return unto him. So you see that? No matter what they've done, no matter how long they had been away, if they would just turn back to God, yield themselves to God, then they're going to find grace and mercy, and He's going to turn His face back to them. He's going to return to them. And they'll find compassion before their enemies. God can, can make your enemy be compassionate towards you. He's going to be gracious. He's going to give them something they don't deserve. He can be merciful. He can keep them from experiencing something that they do deserve, which is just like he did to us. He gave me grace. He gave me the gift of salvation I didn't deserve. He gave me mercy by not putting me in hell, which is where I deserve to go. Now, verse 10, So the posts pass from city to city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh, even unto Zebulun, but they laughed them to scorn and mocked them. So those posts, like postmen, pass from city to city, spreading the, the words, spreading the words of God. They pass through Ephraim and Manasseh, even into Zebulun. But look what happened. They laughed them to scorn and mocked them. Now, when you yield yourself to God, do what God wants you to do, separate yourself from the world, that's going to happen. You're going to get laughed at. This picture is the world laughing at Christians. And that's a very common thing. Even here in the Bible Belt, I get laughed at for how I believe. They think I'm crazy. They think it's stupid. I mean, I'm not under some heavy persecution or nothing for it. But they think you're crazy. Just like in Acts 2.13. What did they say about the apostles up there, they, it says in Acts 2.13, others mocking said these, these men are full of new wine. They were saying they were drunk on grape juice. In 1 Corinthians 1.18, 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it's the power of God. They think what I'm saying is so Silly and stupid and foolish. In Jude 18. Jude 18 says, How that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. See, they're not yielding themselves to God. People walk after their own ungodly lusts. And when they say, see you talking about the things of God, they mock you. So these posts, these postmen are laughed at and mocked. And just be thankful that you're counted worthy to suffer shame for his name and for his word. It says in verse 11 in Second Chronicles 30, Nevertheless, divers of Asher and Manasseh and of Zebulun, Zebulun humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. See, even though you're going to have people that mock you, if if the majority mock you, most likely the majority will mock you, say bad things about you, think what you're saying stupid because it's a broad way to hell. There's more people rejecting the message than there is receiving the message. At the same time, it's all worth it because divers of people are going to humble themselves and come to Jerusalem. Divers of people are going to receive the message and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Just like here, diverse of these people humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem to keep the Passover to the house of the Lord. And God just wants people to humble themselves. And in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 6, it says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. So what are some results of yielding yourself to the Lord? Well, just like we already talked about in verse 9, you find grace and mercy. The Lord God, it will be graceful, will show you grace and mercy. And, of course, at the same time, a result of yielding yourself to God is persecution. These posts got laughed to scorn. They laughed, them, laughed at them and mocked them. You're going to find people mocking you when you yield yourself to God. But then... On the up, once again on the upside, verse 11, diverse of these people humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. You're going to get some faithful followers. That's a result of yielding. They're going to see you yielding to the Lord, and then they're going to yield to the Lord. Faithful followers who are like-minded. In verse 12, it says, Also in Judah, the hand of God was to give them one heart to do the commandment of the king. One heart. And of the princes, by the word of the Lord. So one heart. Let's look at that for a second. First Chronicles 12, 38. It says, All these men of war that could keep rank came with a perfect heart to Hebron to make David king over all Israel. And all the rest also of Israel were of one heart. To make David king. You see they're all in one accord. They're all in agreement. They all got the same goal that they want to do. The same plan. The same purpose. And when a bunch of Bible believers get together. You're going to find they got the same plan. Purpose. They're of one heart. They want Jesus Christ king. David. King David is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when Bible believers get together. The goal. The plan. The purpose should be to make Jesus Christ king of their church, their heart, their life. Just like these people had one heart back there in 1 Chronicles 12, 38, to make David king. And here, these people in 2 Chronicles 30, and verse 12, they had one heart to do the commandment of the king. These are faithful followers who are like-minded. They got the same goal, they got the right goal. When you yield yourself to God, you're going to have faithful followers who are like-minded. And a result of yielding to God is a, a turning from sin. In verse, look at 2 Chronicles 30 and verse 13. And there assembled at Jerusalem much people to keep the feast of unleavened bread in the second month. See, it was all worth it. Much people assembled. A very great congregation. While there was a lot of people that laughed and mocked. There's a lot of people that came there, a very great con congregation. And they arose and took away the altars. You see, when you yield yourself to God, it's going to result in a turning from sin. It's going to result in somebody taking away some bad things out of their life. Now, you, you, we know we don't get saved by turning away from sin, sins in the sense of you don't get saved by stopping your sins you don't stay saved by stopping your sins but when a person gets in the scriptures when a person goes to god for fellowship when a person really starts trying to yield themselves to the holy spirit you're going to see them get rid of their sins it has nothing to do with their salvation it has nothing to do with them keeping their salvation it doesn't even have anything to do with them proving their salvation. But if you you got two options. You got the Holy Spirit in you and you've got the flesh. If you yield yourself to the Holy Spirit, you're going to see victory over sin. If you yield yourself to the flesh, then you're going to be a Christian who looks just like the sinful world. That's what, you've got two options. You've got yielding yourself to the Holy Spirit and yielding yourself to the flesh, the world, and the devil. And a Christian can live their whole life yielding themselves 
to the flesh, the world, and the devil. And that's what most of them are doing. Even the ones that you see at church all the time. Most likely, you follow them through the week, they're yielding themselves to the flesh, the world, and the devil. Doesn't mean they're not saved. Doesn't mean that they're not going to heaven. But it does mean they're going to eventually lose assurance of their salvation, the joy of their salvation. They're going to lose their health, their testimony, their rewards. They're not going to lose their salvation, but they still have a lot to lose in, in this life and then rewards in the life hereafter. So you want to yield yourself. And it says in verse 14, they arose and took away the altars. The altars that, that were used for worship to false gods. They took away the altars that were in Jerusalem and all the altars for incense they took away and cast them into the brook Kedron. Take the things in your life that are used and causing you to, to stay off track and cast them away. Get rid of them. Then they killed the Passover on the 14th day of the second month and the priests and the Levites were ashamed and sanctified themselves and brought in the burnt offerings into the house of the Lord. You see that they were ashamed. When someone yields themselves to God, it, they're going to be under conviction and ashamed of the things that they, bad things they had been doing. You know, Paul, Paul talks about, he said, What fruit had ye in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? He said that in Romans 6.21. He says, What fruit had ye in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. You see, I think back about the things I did before I was saved. And I'm ashamed of those things. The end of those things is death. If I were to continue doing those things, I'm just living for the flesh. And it says, Paul says, For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. You see, don't. Don't get too into your testimony. You see, a lot of times somebody, I've seen somebody give me their testimony, and man, they got a really big smile on their face when they're talking about their old, you know, drunken stories. It's like they're taking pleasure in reliving that. You want to be ashamed. If you are really in the book and you're really close to God, you're going to be ashamed of those things you used to do. Now, I do believe, you know, there's some value. Like Paul said, I was before a persecutor and a blasphemer and injurious, but I obtained mercy. Paul's got that testimony where he's telling you, you know, if I, if I could be saved, a guy like me that persecuted the church of God and wasted it as he talks about, then you can be saved. There's value in that. There's some good that comes from that. But for the most part, a lot of times, people's testimony is just feeling people's minds with more slop and it's almost like you know they're glorying in their old sinful days a little bit but these the priests and the levites were ashamed and sanctified themselves so they got under conviction that's a result of you know somebody seeing you yield yourself to god it puts them under conviction and they sanctify themselves they separate themselves and brought in the burnt offerings into the house of the lord they sanctify themselves and bring in the offerings and they stood in their place after their manner according to the law of moses the man of god the priests sprinkled the blood which they received of the hand of the levites for there were many in the congregation that were not sanctified Therefore, the Levites had the charge of killing the Passover for everyone that was not clean to sanctify them unto the Lord. You see, we got something so much greater today. You don't have to have somebody else do anything for you. No, somebody else can't do it for you. You sanctify yourself in, 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 in a moment, in an instant. You can sanctify yourself you can get you got you get saved and right then god sanctifies you once and for all your your soul is set apart cut loose from your flesh set apart and then right now you can sanctify yourself from the world start living right and can be in complete fellowship with the lord 
It says in verse 18, For a multitude of the people, even many of Ephraim, Manasseh, Issachar, and Zebulun, had not cleansed themselves, yet did they eat the Passover otherwise than it was written. Otherwise than it was written, but Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, The good Lord pardon everyone. Look at 1 Timothy 2.1. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 1. It says, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, and intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Hezekiah is taking upon himself to pray for all these men. He said, the good Lord pardon every one. Hezekiah's heart is that all these people be right with God, even the ones that had not cleansed themselves. But see, today, if you've not cleansed yourselves, you don't need somebody like Hezekiah to, to help you. You can do it yourself. It says they had not cleansed themselves. You can cleanse yourself. How do you cleanse yourself? Well, if you're saved, the best way to cleanse yourself when it comes to your flesh is to go to the Scriptures. It says in Psalm 119.9, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Get in the Scriptures. That will cleanse the filth out of your mind. You'll be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In 1 John 1, 1.9, if you've been living in filth as a Christian, it says in 1 John 1, 1.9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, that's not talking about your soul. Your soul was already cleansed the moment you believed the gospel, and it never got corrupted and, and dirty again because your soul was cut loose from your flesh. So when you sinned in the flesh, it didn't get applied to the soul, but your flesh gets filthy, and you can, you can cleanse yourself through the Word, through prayer, and you can do that on your own. You, yourself, you turn to the scriptures. You turn to prayer. And God's going to see that you're yielding yourself to him. And he'll cleanse you. So, verse 19. Second Chronicles 30 and verse 19. The good, Lord the good Lord pardon everyone that prepareth his heart to seek God. And the Lord God of his fathers, though he be not cleansed according to the purification of the sanctuary. So you see that? Willing hearts. You yield yourself, what's the result? You're going to see others get willing hearts. Everyone that prepareth his heart to seek God. He may not be exactly where he needs to be. There's a lot of people who aren't exactly where they need to be. They hadn't cleansed themselves according to the purification of the sanctuary. They hadn't done it all. They hadn't done and been doing all that needed to be done. But you can see that they have prepared their heart to seek God. There's a lot of people you might see and when you go to church and stuff. They may not be exactly where they need to be, but you can tell they've prepared their heart to seek God. They may still have on uh, ACDC shirt or something. They may still be wearing a... a, a horrible clothes and stuff but you can tell something in them is trying to seek God they may not have it right on the outside they may all the way they may still be coming to church you know listening to rock music or something or really bad music or maybe they still let out some cuss words but still at the same time you can see in there when they talk that they they are preparing their heart to seek God you see, it's a growth process. Everybody's on a different level because some are yielding themselves more to God than other people. Some have been yielding themselves to God longer than other people. You just have to be patient with people. That's why in 1 Timothy 3, you know, one of the characteristics to look for in a pastor is, you know, he's long-suffering, patient. You got to be patient with people. Everybody's on a different level. So he says, The good Lord pardon every one that prepareth his heart to seek God, the Lord God of his fathers, though he be not cleansed according to the purification of the sanctuary. And the Lord hearkened to Hezekiah and he healed the people. So God heard Hezekiah's prayer. Once again, you're going to see 
God hears Hezekiah's prayers a lot. And the children of Israel that were present at Jerusalem kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with great gladness. They did it with great gladness. And there's a joy that comes along with serving God. And the Levites and the priests praised the Lord day by day, singing with loud instruments unto the Lord. And the Church of Christ would have had a fit if they saw this. But they used loud instruments. Ephesians 5, 19. Ephesians 5 and verse 19 says, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now I know that doesn't say instruments, but it does say Psalms, speaking to yourselves in Psalms. And if you go to the Psalms, what is David doing? He's using loud instruments. What are they doing here? They're using loud instruments and singing day by day unto the Lord. Colossians 3.16, the same thing. It says, Colossians 3.16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in Psalms and hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And it's day by day they did it. Back there in verse 21, it's day by day. This is a day by day thing. It's a day by day battle of staying right and keeping yourself clean. Paul said in 1 Corinthians fifteen thirty one, I protest by your rejoicing which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. See, you want to die daily. You want to wake up every day and tell your flesh, you're dead, I'm not serving you, I'm serving God, I'm turning back to God, I'm going to yield myself to the Holy Spirit and not to the wicked flesh. Now, first, or Second Chronicles 30, 22. And Hezekiah spake comfortably unto all the Levites that taught the good knowledge of the Lord. Notice that they taught the good knowledge of the Lord. That's a result of yielding yourself to God. You'll, you'll teach the right doctrine. So they taught the good knowledge of the Lord. Second Peter 3 verse 18 says, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. When you yield yourself to God, you will get, you'll grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You'll get around the people that teach the good knowledge of the Lord. And you can begin teaching the good knowledge of the Lord. You'll get off the milk and get into the strong meat. They taught the good knowledge of the Lord. And they did eat throughout the feast seven days, offering peace offerings and making confession to the Lord God of their fathers. Look at that, making confession. Like that verse we just said, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we don't have to make confession to a man. We don't have to make confession to a priest. We have or we have a high priest. For we have a high priest which can not be, that was all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And we don't need a man in a confessional booth to confess our sins to. We go straight to the Lord Jesus Christ and we make confession, not to get saved, not to stay saved, but to stay in fellowship. They yielded themselves. They saw Hezekiah yielding himself. They saw his men yielding themselves. So they yielded themselves and they end up making confession. And the whole assembly took counsel to keep other seven days. And they kept other seven days with gladness. Notice they're doing it with gladness. The commandments aren't grievous. You know, it shouldn't be a, a, just a, a nuisance to serve God. Once you get really get close to God, getting the scriptures, it's a joy. You're doing it with gladness because you've got that monkey off your back. You've got the sin off your back. You're not, you know, caring about this heavy backpack of sin. That's why Paul says, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. You see, you get that sin off your back. 
and you're glad. You don't have to carry that around anymore. For Hezekiah, verse 24, For Hezekiah, king of Judah, did give to the congregation a thousand bullocks and seven thousand sheep. And the princes gave to the congregation a thousand bullocks and ten thousand sheep. And a great number of priests sanctified themselves. And all the congregation of Judah with the priests and the Levites, and all the congregation that came out of Israel, and the strangers that came out of the land of Israel, and that dwelt in Judah, rejoiced. Notice the joy that comes along with yielding yourself to God. The gladness. Notice it just keeps saying over and over. Gladness. Joy. Rejoicing. So there was, verse 26, so there was, once again, great joy. Look at Galatians 5.22. There was great joy. And in Galatians 5.22 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. That's a fruit of the Spirit. You, you walk in the Spirit. You yield yourself to the Spirit. A fruit of that is going to be great joy when you yield yourself. For since the time of Solomon, the son of, this is back in verse 26 of 2 Chronicles 30. For since the time of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, remember Solomon, the richest man who ever lived, the wisest man who ever lived, the man who wrote Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, Song of Solomon. For since the time of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, there was not the like in Jerusalem. So Hezekiah, yielding himself to God, he's brought things back. Not as Probably not as good, obviously, to the time of Solomon, but as close as it's gotten to being that good, he's brought it back to that. Then the priests and Levites arose and blessed the people, and their voice was heard. And their prayer came up to his holy dwelling place, even unto heaven. Notice that. Solomon. King, all the way back to it like it was in King Solomon. Hezekiah most likely, obviously, had to make copies of the Proverbs. In Proverbs 25, you know, Solomon wrote the Proverbs. And in Proverbs 25, 1, it says, These are also Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied out. So, see... Hezekiah had them copying the Proverbs. No wonder it got like it was, it was close to like it was in the days of Solomon because they were reading those Proverbs, that wisdom. Maybe they were doing the thing we do today where a proverb a day and you make it through the whole thing in a month. So in verse 26 it says, it says, For since the time of Solomon... The son of David, king of Israel, there was not the like in Jerusalem. Then the priests and Levites arose and blessed the people, and their voice was heard, and their prayer came up to his holy dwelling place, even unto heaven. So God heard their prayers. They yielded themselves to God. They got back on track with God. And it says in Hebrews fourteen or Hebrews four sixteen, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need.